In all maps, uh, including Islamic uh, and Persian maps, the territory north of the Arax River is, until the 10th, 11th century, is called uh, Aran, Albania, Caucasian Albania. Uh, Strabo writes about Albanians uh, being in that territory. They lived, he says, 26 tribes who didn't even understand each other's languages. Yeah. Uh, and it got carried on and the British and uh, European uh, and the historians and the chroniclers have written about the same thing. Uh, when the Caucasian Albanians uh, accepted Islam, uh, the area was ruled by various Khans appointed by military rulers and by the rulers of either Ottomans or the uh, Persian empires. Uh, at that time, the territory started to be called Shirvan. Uh, which continued until the 1918. Yeah. And in 1918, uh, the pan-Turkist uh, party of Musawat, when the country was established, the three countries of the South Caucasus claimed independence after the fall of the M Russian Empire. The two countries, Georgia and Armenia, reverted to their old names, but uh, the country of Azerbaijan didn't go back to their Shir name Shirvan but decided to use, at that time, decided to establish the Republic of Azerbaijan, taking, borrowing the name from the neighboring province of Iran. Yeah. Uh, it's similar to Macedonia, when after independence this happens, and there, there, there was a piece of Yugoslavia that is called itself Macedonia. Gajik Sarkisian continues with his analysis of the book, discussing the fundamental identity changes a country goes through during the transitional process. He believes that Azerbaijan's period of change was legitimate as they were forming a new country, but concedes that they may have gone too far with some of their objectives. Kangig, obviously in 1918 when Azerbaijan w was formed, any new nation, however it comes to be about, wants to sort of create its identity. Do you think it's sort of gone too far in trying to sort of crush the history of others in order to achieve that? I think so. Uh, it's, um, um, it's perhaps quite legitimate to... Um, try and create an identity when you form a new country. Like, for example, Lebanon. Uh, uh, there's a certain segment of the Lebanese population that claims uh, descent from uh, Phoenicians. Uh, I don't think, however, that they are trying to falsify the, the history of the region and, and their neighbors in order to establish this identity. I think the Azerbaijanis have gone too far unnecessarily. They could have just continued to, to build this new nation uh, that came into being in 1918, even, even if the name had no historical um, precedence in, in, the, um, in the region. They, they could have either accepted that and carried on. Uh, would have, that would have created a better uh, relations with, with their neighbours. Um. Do you think the, the mindset of the sort of essentially the ruling clans, because it's much of a democracy, is, is cl clearly fueled because of the oil and gas wealth, but that's not going to go on forever. Do, do you think the sort of big stamping attitude is something that will temper with time? I think it has, it has been intensified by, by the petrodollars pouring into Azerbaijan, but uh, this isn't something which started in 1991-92. It had been going on in, in Soviet times as well, to a milder degree, but it's, uh, it's a process which started so, some time ago and it's continuing. Whether or not it will come to an end when the economic might disappears, I don't know. And you, you can understand that for sort of first or second generation Armenians who have settled into you know, different parts of Europe for example, here in London, but for the younger generation, for the sort of the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren of, of people who've gone through all the changes, do they stay, still take an interest in the sort of history that Ruben writes about here, or is it more, well, we're now in London, let's get on with London, and that was grandpa's problem, it's not um, mine? I think, uh, surprisingly, an increasing number do, mm. uh, uh, both here and, and in, in other parts of the army and diaspora that I know, like like France and, and North America, uh, that I would say perhaps more so than their parents did. Really? Uh, the parents who were more concerned about um, um, 
establishing a business, getting, uh, uh, getting an income to um, make the family live. Now their children, um, who are born and bred in, in, in their countries of, the, of, of uh, the host country, they, I think an increasing number is taking uh, more interest in, in what's happened That's and what's happening now. The author develops the arguments disseminated in his book with a particular focus on the history and the cultural changes that Azerbaijan, Armenia and Iran have all gone through. He also touches upon the influence that Joseph Stalin has upon the region after the Second World War. Later in Chapter 1, he states that Stalin's method of realising this political course, the elimination of inequality, was known as Korenzatsiya, translated roughly by Yuri Sletskine as taking root or radicalization, which continued until the 1920s and 1930s, or, according to some researchers, much longer. You deal a, a little bit in your book, not, not for a, a, a large part, but in, in one of the early chapters with the influence of the, the, the sort of Soviet Union, Soviet Empire, however we want to describe it, and, and how that part of the geography fit, was fitting into that. Uh, when the, the communists took over the countries, yeah. those three countries, and they kept the name of Azerbaijan, which was a newly, newly installed name, because it suited their purpose. In the future, they could use it to their political end. Uh, so this happened in 1947, when uh, the, after the Second World War, the area tried to be joined with Soviet Azerbaijan. And again, in 1990s, El Bey claimed that these are our brothers, they have to join us. And uh, they even changed the name of Iranian province of Azerbaijan to Southern Azerbaijan. But all these were in encouraged by Stalin's policies and decrees. Given the sort of the new creation of Azerbaijan in 1918 and the disparate peoples that live in that geography, what, what would the principal language be? What would the culture be? Well, the principal language of the region, people of the region, uh, from the 14th, 15th centuries onwards became the Turkic because those were the tribes of that ruling the area. And the principal language was Turkic, but during the 18th and 19th century, any written language was in Farsi, the Farsi lettering and Farsi language. All the historians who lived in the areas uh, of uh, Baku, Pakhi Khanov, and Karabaghi, which lived in Karabagh, they've written their history books in uh, Farsi. So the modern Azerbaijanis cannot read them, so they have to heavily depend on transliteration and translation of these. They speak the same language, now Turkish, but in 1920, until 1929 it was in Farsi script, Arabic. 29 changed to Syri uh, Latin. In 1939 they changed it to Cyrillic, Russian alphabet. In 1992 back to Latin. So you can imagine, what alphabet <laughs> could the local people read? Yeah. Now there's hardly anyone that can read the old books. So when transliterating, they have a free hand how to change and what to alter there. And they do it freely and very, very aggressively. And how does that relate to the Azerbaijani view of Armenia and Armenians? Uh, well, it's the completely the reverse. The Azerbaijanis say the Armenians appeared in this part of the world in 1828, when yeah. after the um, Turkmen Chai agreement, they, the territory was ceded to Russia. Uh, but many travelers, not, not only maps, many travelers who came to the area, European travelers who passed through the area, came to the area, have written and about you the sort Armenians. of quote them in your book as well, don't you? Different eras, especially in the 18th century. It's, uh, oh yeah, yeah. You, I've yeah. quoted from the 15th, 14th century onwards, travelers talking about the Armenians and Armenians. And look, uh, even going back to Azeri uh, history books, they claim that Shah Abbas of Iran was an Azeri. Uh, fine, okay, let's accept it. Uh, but he's, they, they say there's no Armenian living in the area. Shah Abbas, in the year 1604 and 1605, uh, uh, moved but three, four hundred thousand Armenians from Nakhichevan and Garabagh to Isfahan to, uh, and established a city called New Julfa there and settled the ar part of the Armenians there. Uh, and this is in the record, everybody knows that. So even their, their own history books had written about that. Yeah. 
But, but they, they refute that. They said there's no Armenians living in the area. There's another sample, for instance, regarding cultural monuments. In uh, Julfa, on the um, uh, shores of the Arax River, north of that, which is the, in, under Azerbaijani control now, there used to be a medieval Armenian cemetery with all the cross stones with carvings in Armenia until 1997 when they, the Azeris started to uh, wreck them and topple them and break them into pieces. Eventually in 2005 they completely eliminated them and now it's a military maneuver ground there. Ruben concludes the interview with his thoughts on identity, deep-rooted culture and national transition. He believes that there is a fight within everybody to protect themselves, their borders and their fundamental interests and that countries behave exactly the same. So tell us a little about the, the chapter where you deal with um, changing cultures in, in chapter four. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, there are, uh, the Azerbaijanis claim that they have had a uh, country there for at least 5,000 years. For 2,000 years they have an independent country and their own culture, etc. Khajan Asireddin Tusi is a Persian astronomer who from the name we know that he was born in Tus, which is about a thousand miles from Azerbaijan. Because he came to Marage, which is Azerba Iranian Azerbaijani province, which Azerbaijan Republic of Azerbaijan claims to be part of their country, and established an observatory there, they claim that Haji Nasiruddin Tusi is an Azeri scientist, Azeri historian, uh, astronomer. This goes on and on, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, all the uh, cities, mon monuments in Iranian Azerbaijan and in Armenia are claimed to be part of the Azeri heritage. If, if you're in that area, you have to fight with li life and death for your own uh, history. All your neighbors will try to alter your history to their own benefit. One has to fight claw and tooth to preserve their own history. Uh, my point was that when I started this work, to first write the book in English and then translate it into Armenia or R uh, Russian. In this particular case, this book is being translated, has been translated into Farsi, and I hope that this year it can be printed in Iran. Yeah. Ruben, I think that's a very good point to end. I think it's a fascinating book you've written. I think the maps are absolutely glorious. And it was a, a wonderful read, and I think you must be very proud of the way you defended your, your family's history. Thank you. Thank you.